I think the U.S. will remain a very rich economy, but we will not be the only major economy in the world. At some point, we were actually seeing China overtaking the U.S. in the late 2020s as the world's largest economy. But of course, things changed a lot in the years since then, and we saw China very much not emerged unscathed, economically speaking, from the pandemic themselves. So the main issue facing China today is that the population, private sector, the investors, they don't believe that the economy is going to grow. For a while, people had worried that uh, China you know, may take over the United States, but Chinese growth is not anymore potentially. a little bit symbolic who is the world's largest economy but i do think that it has some very real repercussions in terms of international clout in terms of military power and also in terms of economic power as well there isn't a guarantee that the citizens the residents of the world's largest economy will be the ones in the world that are the best of so that doesn't take into account things like living standards which are much better measured by gdp per capita for example and on that measure china is absolutely nowhere near catching up with the us the us is still quite dynamic with a lot of innovation so i think that the private sector actually innovates a lot just can be in the most advanced technology of the future, AI, machine learning, robotic automation. But we have in the US many problems. We have a very divided political system, partisanship that is actually damaging of economic activity. The US is positioned well to remain the leading economy in the world, but we cannot take our advantage for granted. You know, the United States, America has a lot of advantages. We have great natural resource base, the electricity costs are very low, the land costs are very low, the water, so all these things are necessary to produce a, a powerful manufacturing base. But the most problematic aspect is lack of consistency over a number of years. America has always talked Jefferson, but acted Hamilton. So they've always had an industrial strategy. The big change today is that US competitiveness First of all, it's not happening in a mercantilistic way that Trump was advocating for, was just build a wall or, you know, you know, the whole stuff about trade relationships. It's about investment, investment, investment. The CHIPS Act, for example, which I helped to inform, I helped Secretary of Commerce Jeanette Amondo really think through some of the conditionality embedded in it. This is a lot of money, right? So how do we make sure that this money, which the U.S. is using for competitiveness, embodies within it conditions that really helps to rethink the social contract. On the other hand, in China, we have seen a few hiccups continuing in terms of the domestic housing market and a quite slow recovery from the release of the COVID measures. The most recent wealth report sees China overtaking the U.S. as the world's largest economy in 2037. At some point, we were actually seeing the China overtaking the U.S. in the late 2020s. But of course, things changed a lot in the years since then, and we saw China very much not emerged unscathed, economically speaking, from the pandemic themselves. China still does have good business and economic fundamentals. They still have the world's most advanced and complete supply chain, even though that supply chain has been under some challenge uh, because of COVID and, and also because of uh, deglobalization. This today, uh, China is the largest foreign direct investor trading partner and uh, 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 lender to many developed and developing countries. Um, depending on what day it is, the, the, China is the first or second largest foreign lender to the U.S. government. By one measure, what we call purchasing power adjusted GDP, China is already larger than the U.S. But Americans should understand, China's living standards are roughly one third 
of Americans' living standards. Of course, given the size of its population, the purchasing power of the Chinese consumer is hugely important. We're still expecting China to continue to grow quite robustly. But one big factor um, they have playing against them is the various demographics dynamics. So China is seeing an aging population a low birth rate and a rising dependency ratio, which means that there are relatively fewer working age people. So these dynamics actually are visible in the US as well to some extent, but in China, they're a lot more severe. And this is an important factor in the longer term that we're expecting to impede growth. And uh, as a crackdown with the private sector with uh, state capitalism, uh, they also risk to, how to say, to diminish the innovation in the private sector. So China is putting itself in the foot. And if we look back at what happened in China between 1990 and about 2010, the government had relatively low government debt at a, a federal level and was able to spend quite strongly on infrastructure. So in contrast, although India is ramping up its spending on infrastructure in terms of government uh, spending, there will need to be greater reliance on private sector investment, both from Indian domestic multinational companies, but also from uh, international investors from the private sector. India is performing very strongly at the moment. India is on track to be the fastest growing economy amongst the G20 nations by quite a considerable margin. In context, what we've seen is quite rapid growth in the previous two years as well. And that has actually propelled India to becoming the world's fifth largest economy when it overtook the UK back in 2021. And it has about 1.4 billion people. But the demographics are still very youthful compared to other large Asian economies such as Japan, South Korea or China, which have aging demographics. So that's potentially quite an important advantage over the next 20 years. But the problem with India is that they cannot do that consistently. You need to achieve 6%, 7% consistently for 10 years and 20 years. Then you're talking about something closer to the Chinese economic performance. When we talk about India becoming the world's largest economy, that is a much longer time horizon and into the 2080s. And forecasting that far out, you need to consider a range of scenarios. Um, so this is just one of the possible scenarios. Ultimately, a degree of cooperation is in everybody's interest. We will be prosperous if we are nice to each other. Uh, if we are absolutely divided, we will be rich and very unhappy and very unstable. There is a lot of synergies between the U.S. and China. How will they lead in a world where uh, people around the world are looking for more guidance on what types of economics and pol political systems can actually help to, to really drive improvements in people's living standards? However, a couple of very significant things have happened in recent years that have made countries a bit more wary of being very open internationally. So the first one was the COVID pandemic. I would say that the second big global event that happened recently is the Russian invasion of Ukraine. I think the real question is how do we also see these problems as global? Most of the wars in the world, including the Israeli-Palestinian war, are about water. How do we truly see the global hydrological cycle as a common good? The collective action that's required, not just the national action, is critical.